Welcome everyone to the Paradox Podcast, the podcast about the business of the video games industry, where we try to shed a bit of light on the inner workings of our beloved games industry. Hosted by me, Daniel Goldberg, in charge of marketing at Paradox. And, and me, Shams Johnny, in charge of this dev at Paradox. How are you doing, Shams? I'm doing excellent. How are you doing, man? I'm not bad. I'm at home, as we all are, and it feels like we will remain for the foreseeable future, but that doesn't stop us from producing podcasts like there's no tomorrow shams what's your favorite video game sequel easy tie fighter collector cd rom is that really a sequel though of course it is it's i mean it's not called x-wing 2 technically but i mean it's the next game in the series it's an improvement in every area it's the best game ever made and it i mean it does what a sequel needs to do and you know if we want to be really strict about it i'd say maybe sim city 2000 maybe sims 3 they're kind of the aliens and Terminator 2 of our uh, kind of industry. Uh, otherwise, I'd say Mario 64, uh, it was a big, you know, revolutionary leap forward rather than an evolutionary take on what a sequel could be. Mm -hmm. How about you? I was thinking about this the other day. I'd say pro I'm kind of not, I'm not, I'm more into the evolutions rather than revolutions, right? I'd say probably mm -hmm. Assassin's Creed 2 mm -hmm. because it really took... I think what was promising in the first one and, and really made it work. It really delivered on the, on the promise of, of, of Assassin's Creed, I think. Possibly Wipeout uh, 2097, I guess Wipeout XL for all the Americans out there. I'm not, I, I never understood why they rebranded it Wipeout XL. Marketing, man, marketing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But for exactly the same reasons, right? It took the, the magic and the potential of the first Wipeout and just made it work and made it better in yeah. every way of it. Yeah. It's a great question. I'm happy yeah. you asked about sequels. It's funny I should ask that question, right? Because that's yeah. the topic of today's podcast, the business of sequels. We're going to talk uh, a bit about the uh, business rationale that goes into making a sequel or not making a sequel. Show you some, or talk about rather than show, this is a podcast after all, uh, talk about some of the behind the scenes stuff on uh, one particular se sequel that we're all hard at work with at Paradox, namely Crusader Kings 3. Hey, yo. Yes, indeed. We uh, um, we do have yeah we do have quite a few sequels in the pipeline though we've got uh, CK three obviously there's uh, Bloodlines two which is a pretty big one and then uh, maybe a few others we're not really ready to talk about just yet maybe so let's get started okay so we've actually got a, a yet another special guest with us in the episode today none other than our very own max welts uh, product manager for crusader kings 3. uh max is like us recording from home so we apologize in advance if the audio quality isn't uh isn't that 100 studio level yeah even so welcome to the podcast max uh, thanks Daniel. thanks Shams. thanks for having me here happy to be here actually as we record this i realized that next week is my one anniversary at paradox it seemed like a good way to celebrate Wow. Okay, yeah, we, haven't, we haven't told you this, but this is everyone who gets to be on the podcast when they're, they're at their one year anniversary. <laughs> <Exactly>. it's, like, <laughs> it's part of the onboarding. I'm going to have a lot of but guests. Congrats. Uh, and, so we've uh, covered this before in the podcast, Max, but can you just briefly enlighten us? What the hell does a product manager do at Paradox and why do we need you? Briefly, yeah, that's going to be a challenge. <laughs> but uh, I mean, the baseline is I'm accountable for the, the budget and the financial health of the, of the games I'm in charge of. That means kind of a lot of spreadsheets. Uh, I own the business case. That's more than just the raw numbers, right? It's also about what the game is, how we deliver it, uh, what we're aiming for together with the team, making sure we know audience and we'll reach them. Uh, of course, I don't do that all alone, right? Uh, I don't think anyone wants me to be designing games or making game traders. I, to do that, so I lead the product team, what we call the product team at Paradox for CK3. Uh, Linda, our producer, Christian, our product marketing manager, and Henry, our game director, work with me. And I make sure we're all working towards the, the same vision for the game and the product. And we do all, all the time what's best for the, the project, what's best for the, the company's strategic vision, right? I try to keep looking at the big picture and make sure that they do the same as well. Hmm. So, um, sequels then. Shams, you've, uh, you've been here a long time, a long, long time at, <laughs> at Paradox. And we're obviously, uh, we're obviously quite known for our long running, uh, you know, long running franchises like Europa Universalis, Hearts of Iron, Crusader Kings for that matter. All of these games are up to their fourth or in the case of CK3 approaching their third iterations. So, you know, why, why sequels? What's the rationale for us doing sequels? Why do we, why do we do sequels for our games? Would you say? Money. No, <laughs> but ultimately, like, the, money is the reason, but I'll come back to that. Like, ultimately, games are 
software development projects, right? And software development excels when there's iteration. Like you don't make things in one go. You have to tweak them. And when you have system-driven games like we do, iteration is everything. So there's little surprise that, you know, Stellaris didn't come out of thin air. It was, I think, the 14th or 15th grand strategy game we ever released, and not counting the, you know, the cancelled ones. Um, so it's no surprise that it ended up being fairly goodish, even amazing-ish, I would say. Mm -hmm. Secondly, from a pure business perspective, there's probably no better way of de-risking a project. The sequel done right inherently should have in less risk. Can you? Uh, that's interesting. Can you elaborate a little bit on on that? Well, um, it's a big topic, but you know, I think a rule of thumb in the industry is that for a sequel, you want to keep one third of the game exactly the same. You want to improve one third and add one third of new stuff. The, the trick is, of course, making sure that you don't take out the wrong stuff, right? Uh, and put in uh, the wrong stuff. Ideally, you can reuse tech and design. You can iterate on those. And largely, um, you're selling to the same audience as you were last time, but maybe climbing into some adjacencies nearby. And also, hopefully, you're working on a what by now should be a known IP. So inherently in those things, tech, design, audience, IP, those are the major things that create risk in a project. So, you know, there's also a misconception that a sequel should theoretically cost less uh, as you're reusing stuff. But I think this is a lie that we tell ourselves to get to do what we want to keep doing. 99% of sequels are, cost more than the previous game. I don't know, Max, do you have any experience on this? Do sequels ever cost less? Uh, looking at the budget for CK3, I'm going to have to say no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, right? You, you want to hit something bigger and better and more badass, so the mm -hmm. chances that the budget will be less is probably hampered by that. Uh, I want to uh, sort of a, another perspective on the same question. Uh, yes, we, you know, many of our core franchises are up to their fourth or third iterations, but these are also franchises that, that have been around for a long, long time. Yeah. And anyone who follows Paradox knows that we're quite good at keeping our games alive for a very long time. You know, there's been there's been many, many expansions to Stellaris, to Cities, uh, to Hearts of Iron and Crusader Kings, for that matter without there necessarily being a you know a sequel coming out so so maybe maybe from that perspective how how do we then decide when the time is right for a sequel yeah and i think that this is you, you touch upon something really uh salient here and then again paradox is not the average gaming company uh you know we we ask the question do we at all need sequels because mm. as we know that's not the way our games are kind of run but continuing along the path of like how Paradox uh, runs things is that we don't we don't start doing sequels until a certain number of you know base conditions are in place. One of which is that the dev team making the game feel it is the right time. Like we've said it many times before. No, it's not like we need to do an internal survey to find out that the business people at Paradox and Publishing wants to do sequels for Victoria or Stellaris or everything. Of course, it makes a lot of business sense to do sequels. But the question is, uh, is that the best way of making money? So it all comes back to uh, creating a business framework for our creative and product teams to come back and say, hey, within this kind of broad target that you want to hit in the next five years, here's our suggestions. And we feel that this is a good time to kind of uh, move on uh, to something that's good, but they need to kind of take that initiative. But that said, that's not that's how we do it. Uh, we know that for many other companies, it's a much more formalized process of like, there's a FIFA every year, end of story. Yeah. I think you can simplify this answer a lot. I think, it, you know, the, 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 the primary condition, it, it can't really start until the dev team that is responsible for a particular franchise has a vision and actually wants to do it, right? We never force these things, is kind of what you're saying. I mean, of course, there are, you know, there's revenue targets to hit, but people like myself or you, Shams, we can't really tell uh, our studios and game directors what to do. It's kind of, it has to start with them. Yeah. It has to start with an idea and a vision of where you want to go with something. We can sort of, we can sort of use Excel spreadsheets and gently nudge in the right, the right direction, but it's not, it's, it's, it has to be driven by vision at the end. Of the yeah. Day. And even that conversation, I think, starts in the same way we're doing now. We're asking, Henrik or whoever it is, like, when do what do you think about a sequel to X? When would would it make sense? And then that's yeah. how the conversation starts, rather than like our spreadsheet tells us we need a sequel by twenty twenty three. 
I think maybe adding some stuff from the from the marketing side as well. As you touched upon, Champs, it's really about it's about leverage. Uh, SQL is really about leveraging an existing audience to grow the audience, right? It's about it's about giving something new and really cool to an audience that that is already attached to one of our games, and hopefully making it so cool and so new that that audience grows. So it's it's also about finding that sweet spot in time where the the old game, as it were, is kind of on its last legs. But it can't be too late because then the audience might have moved on, and it can't be too early because then you're losing out on revenue from the old game, right? So it's 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 also about finding that particular po- moment in time where the the fan base you want to serve is kind of is kind of receptive to a sequel, and it sort of makes sense for from their perspective as well. Absolutely. So so Max, let's bring you into the conversation a bit more and talk more about. Um, CK3, we had so many good questions from uh, our listeners for this episode. So thanks everyone who pinged us on on Twitter and Discord and, and the forum. Uh, but but let's start digging into those. Let's do the big one first, uh, Max. I don't think you are necessarily the guy to answer this, but I'm gonna <laughs> I'm just gonna throw you under the bus with it. Uh, so Max, why does CK2 get a sequel and not, for example, Victoria 2? <laughs> thanks for starting me off with a with a curveball there. I'm not quite sure there's a combination of words that won't be twisted to mean that Vicky 3 is confirmed, but uh, I will try to to answer regardless. <laughs> and just maybe uh, for, for the record, like Max is not the person who could confirm that anyway. So, you know, just so that that's said, right? Max is working on CK3, not something else. Sorry, Max, go on. Yeah, that's, that's right. I'm the CK3 guy. I can confirm yeah. CK3. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you touched upon, both of you, a lot of good stuff, right? It's a lot of a matter of stars aligning. You, you need a strong vision for what the next game could be coming from the studio, a game director to lead all of this. It needs to be at the right time vis the, the previous project. I think it's like a number of questions to answer, right? It's like, can we do more with uh, the CK brand? It, do we want to do more? It, does the game director have more ideas, more designs they want to explore? And if so, should that be done on CK2? Can we do it? Do we need a fresh start in, from a tech or design perspective? Do we still have the space to innovate? Mm. How has the game aged so far? And where are we in its life cycle? And depending on yes, where it could just be a new expansion for CK2, or it could just be a new game like CK3 or a sequel, right? Uh, of course, there's financial consideration, right? CK, did, CK2 did sell a bit more than uh, Victoria 2, if you look at it. Mm. Uh, so it kind of skewed the balance more heavily towards what should the studio do? Uh, probably to a sequel, right? Because there was more money there. Uh, and it's also opportunity cost, right? Between all the projects we have in flight right now and what other projects we could be looking at. I keep being told that we can't expand infinitely the amount of people who recruit all the time. So we, we have to make choices, right? And I guess Seek was the, the first one there. So maybe two, two follow-up questions on that. Again, these are from our listeners, so thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, CK2, so Crusader Kings 2 is arguably if not the, then at least one of the most successful games we've ever done as a, as, a, as a company. How do you balance, how do you manage the expectations on that? So how do you balance the expectations uh, on a sequel to a game with such a such an engaged fan base and so many expansions? I mean, many players will compare CK2 with all expansions versus the base CK3 game. And a sort of related question, how do you decide which features from CK2 to keep and which parts to to leave out, so to say? How do you prioritize in that area? Yeah, I mean, from a curveball to a multi-part question, mm. good. good. Uh, I mean, we know that, yes, CK2 has been out for years, right? And at the end of the day, that's what the players will compare CK3 with. They will compare us with what CK2 was at the end of its long journey with all the updates and all the paid content. Whether that's fair or not, I don't know. Uh, but for sure, from the get-go, what we wanted to avoid is this kind of feeling that you have from some sequels where it's every year or every other year, it's one step forward, two step back, or in the best of case, two steps forward, one step back. The, the ambition internally we had and that we tried to communicate fairly early on uh, from the get-go is that we were trying to keep everything from CK2 where we were happy about, right? Like all the stuff we did that we think, yeah, we did a good proper treatment on it. We wanted to keep it, included some of the DLC content and make that part of the, the base game. Uh, as it stands now, we are rather happy with where we are, both in the content and mechanics, in its variety and its quantity. Uh, we haven't stopped at that, of course. We have also improved quite a bit on some of those core uh, mechanics that the players will uh, will see. Uh, uh, of course, that's not to say we'll have everything from CK2, right? There are some stuff that we had to cut, and that or cut not as much as cut as we just decided not to take on, right? 
uh, some stuff that we are not taking uh, over into CK3 are things that we just simply were not happy about the way we didn't, did them the first time around. So we just like link them before the while and we figure out how we do them properly in the context of CK3 later. Some of the stuff also that we just don't think the vast majority of players were enjoying just by looking at the community sentiment, the Steam reviews, but also just that one telemetry to see, okay, what features are interacting with or not. And then, of course, there also some stuff we are happy with and we haven't done, but we kind of would want to do later, uh, like, for instance, the inventory system. Mm. So um, here's another interesting question that ties into that. Um, when, when looking at a sequel for CK3, why do it so shortly after CK2's last paid expansions? Wouldn't Did you guys ever at any time consider waiting it out to get, you know, a get people bored of CK2 or make it easier for you with a sequel? How kind of, do you kind of intentionally pad the timing to make sure that they're not too close? How do you deal with that in marketing? I think I can maybe answer that and you can, you can add if you want a uh, max or, or tell me I'm wrong or whatever. Right. But, but I th it's a difficult balance, right? But, but I, th in some ways we kind of think of it in reverse. It's the same, I'd say in many ways, same logic as when we discount our base games quite heavily. We, we always do that, or we almost always do that whenever expansions or new content are released. We, we discount our base games. And the reason for that is we want, you know, whenever there's new content dropping, we want as many players as possible to be enjoying and to be active in the game. And I'd say the same thing is true for a sequel. When we release CK3, we want as many people as possible across the world to be enjoying or at least in to be invested in ck2 right so that's the reason that is really the primary reason why the the ck2 base game is free since a while back it's free to play you can download it for free on steam today our hope is that that gets more people or a lot many more people interested and sort of aware of ck and that will will help us to drive conversions when the sequel is out uh but obviously this all sort of hinges on the idea that CK3, when it releases, is significantly different enough and sort of fresh enough to convince those people to give it a try. Also, on the topic of expansions, I'd say Holy Fury, which was the last expansion for, for CK2, it released, what, like one and a half years ago? That's not really yesterday. That's still that's still quite a while back. In right? paradox terms, it's like yesterday. But yeah. so this is <laughs> this actually brings up something interesting because some of our you know peers in the industry don't follow this kind of handing over the baton uh, kind of mm. sense. If you look at civilization, it takes like a good year and a half for them before they manage for the newest game in the series to have more players than the mm. previous one. It takes like a full year and a half before they transition on. I actually spoke to a good friend uh, in the industry, Martin Volland. Martin is um, the founder and CEO of Fat Shark, who we've mentioned several times. Uh, they're the makers of the brilliant Vermintide 2. So let's have a, just a listen to what he said about uh, how to time sequels and get them right. So, Martin, um, when you approach sequels, what are the chief concerns from a business perspective when you go about tackling a sequel? You've made a number in your days. Uh, Vermintide 2 is doing really well, and it's, it's, a, it's an improvement in all areas. So how did you go about kind of approaching a sequel, and how do you do it generally? First of all, I think, you know, for us, it's like having a great game like a start it's, it's, it's the business fundamental for us because you know the play expectations obviously when you do a sequel is, is key because you need to get sort of the old players align on board and you need a new one so you need to you know all about it um the concerns would obviously be you cut the revenue from the previous games because like you know if there's a sequel most people tend that at least our games they tend to go to the latest greatest game uh which is obviously equal if you did another game you maybe could have two games in parallel so that you will see a revenue uh decrease in in, in the prequel or the, the game the first game of the series or, the, or like the ones before so how do you plan that out how do you decide that this is a good cutoff point for you to move on to a sequel and kind of sacrifice some of the ongoing revenue then yeah, it's it's a tough one. I I think you know. I mean, games take such such a long time f to make. For us, it takes two to three years, uh, which means like you need to make it way beyond before you actually know that the old game is sort of uh, approaching sunset. Uh, our idea was always to sort of support Vermintide one longer than we did. We we supported like a couple of years after launch, up until launch actually. Um, and I think it's it, it's crucial for us to sort of support the games because it gives us sort of a positive thing going forward. Because for us, you know, as as for you, you guys, it's like the community is so important for you because that's where you like, you know, we don't spend them as much as marketing as the big companies. Uh, in that regard, it's more like trying to like, you know, nurture uh, the place we have, obviously. Um, 
another thing is pricing, obviously, but it also com comes down to pricing. It comes to play perceptions. Like you know, you need to uh, like make sure what you sort of give out to the players, uh, sell to the players, is is, is worth the money. Um, and that could be like if you set the bar for a first game, you can't go too far off, even though they like at least what we have seen so far. But but, but I don't know. We'll see. Um, we 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 stuck with thirty bucks for both Vermintide two games, uh, Vermintide two and Vermintide one, obviously. Um, but you considered maybe going higher for the second one? Yeah, we absolutely. I mean, I, we, the reaction we got from a lot of journalists and from the fans was like, you know, why is it so cheap? Is there something wrong with the game? And so we were thinking about the perception of value because, you know, 30 bucks, uh, you put you in a certain category of games, uh, while like, you know, 40, 50 could signal uh, more quality as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a tough one, you know all about it. It's, it's super hard to, to price a game, uh, but we stuck with it with the same. Um, also because we wanted a lot of people to play the game because we know that sort of like, you know, more players play the game. It's kind of a positive spiral as well. Um, what if you could go back in time and change one single thing, uh, one single business decision you made for Worm Vermintide 2? What would that have been, like with hindsight, with everything you know? It's a good question. I think we, we should probably have had sort of worked up a bit more of like, you know, content to release after launch. I think we just sort of like grinded it all the way into the end and I'm like, okay, we had plans, but sort of like, you know, uh, we you, after a game launch, you get quite excited uh, or uh, tired, I would say, so rather, because you're so focused on getting it right and there's so much stuff going on. Every, or everybody in the dev team reads like every single comment on the internet, like every single review is like, you know, so after launch, we kind of froze a bit in terms of like you know releasing new content i would like that was had to sort of like prepare a bit more content before launch that we could sort of roll out after launch like having a better sort of live service model from the get-go that would be the biggest business decision i think because you know when a lot of people playing your game uh it's it's easier to sell content if, if, if it's if, if you let the concurrent users drop uh, too much until you release it it's, you have a lower attachment rate obviously so um from that perspective i think having more stuff ready it, it usually don't not complete because you still need to testing a lot of things post launch to get it out but but you need to have more content ready um that you are almost there at least because if you start from scratch after launch you you set your it's gonna take some time because the pressure from especially internally like you know if you have a good like you know you're getting good reviews you don't want to screw them up by releasing uh, some additional content that's not up to par of course let me ask you a bonus question since we brought up something interesting what specifically did you do to carry over players from the first game to the second game to make sure that all of them kind of transferred over without dropping them to a competitor for instance i think we worked on multiple fronts obviously um, we try to give reward for people owning the first game to the second game. That's a classic one. You could keep the skins from the first game. Um, I think we did some discounts as well for, I don't remember actually, to be fair. Uh, but we, I think that's a good thing to do as well. Um, so people feel like they're committed to our games so that they can sort of like, they get them a bit cheaper down the road. Um, then of course, I think, um, yeah, we're trying to go to the same sort of like you know places where the, where our f players talk about the game. Obviously, at Discord channels, forums, uh, you know, um, that would be. And also, like I think the biggest again was like you know give them something they wanted, basically keeping the core. I think always a big sort of battle internally, like, like because as a developer you want to do everything new because like you know you feel like you. I mean, we had actually discussions if we could keep the Skavens for the second game because you know would it feel cheap to reuse them? It's like in hindsight, it's like you know. We would be crazy, like would World of Warcraft remove all their enemies from the previous like expansion? Obviously, of course not, like you know. So, but internally we, we had that discussion. I really and like. And also, you know, the game we, is could... called Vermintide, so it's hard. Yeah, to exactly. It feels like you know it's, it's easier if the vermin are actually in the game. If we want to call it Vermintide, <laughs> Maybe too. A bit. Uh, could be a bit of like you know a <laughs> problem when you do Vermintide two without vermins. What Martin says about having content ready to go right after release is something we can relate to, and it's just something you touched upon as well. So we have the exact same issue pop up for most of our games in the past as well, naturally. It's 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 a natural part of making sequels. So. Uh, so we haven't really been very fast to learn here, I think, as well. So it's still something we can do uh, better. Max, what do you think about the follow-up? What do you think? Max? Yeah, I can speak 
bit more on what we want to do with CK2 or CK3 rather, right? Uh, as you can tell, we have a royal edition out there, which has some of our future DLC and content uh, bundled in. So we have put some thoughts, of course, in what we want to do there. The game director and designers have started laying some ideas and design for what that content will be. It looks pretty fun and pretty solid so far. Uh, but for us, of course, right now, the focus is still very much on making the best game. And as you say, we'll be kind of working all the way to the end to make the best game possible for launch. Uh, and after that, our first priority uh, of order will be that we'll focus on player feedback uh, when the game is released before we dig too far into the, the post-launch content. That's the way we want to approach it. We know what we're yeah. going to do if the players really just like the game. We have some ideas and stuff we want to take out first as well, of course. I mean, that's interesting because what you're saying there is also that uh, it's it's dangerous to put too much work into to post-launch content before the game is actually out because you don't really have that much player feedback to work with. You don't you don't really know yet what the, what the players think and what they want. Is that kind of a fair summary of your point there, Max? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there is, uh, as you saw, especially with the type of content we're looking for, uh, mm. looking at for CK3, is going to be fairly large ones and fairly small ones. Uh, I think the for the small one, the the, the flavor exp the flavor packs is going to be uh, interesting for us to look at what the players are really interested in, and also for the the first updates we are looking at. You know, we, we want to make sure we have the room to re respond to player feedback, do some mm. of the things we couldn't do for launch, and so on. Before mm. to find to it, so, so is it dangerous? Yeah, I don't know. So maybe a related question: We talked about expectations management a little bit. A related question to that, and again, this is from from one of our listeners. So thanks again. When developing a sequel, how do you guarantee that the sequel retains the uh, the spirit in quotation marks of the previous game? Can you talk a little bit about that, Max? Yeah, uh, I mean, I have the chance of working with internal studios. It's kind of a different report, and for some of the of my PM colleagues might have. Uh, ultimately, what the vision is for the game is entirely in the hands of the, the game director, right? And retaining the spirit of the brand of the previous games will come from many places. Of course, the game director and the game teams we have in the studio are just passionate fans of our games in the first place. So I think just even internally, we would get a lot of voices uh, coming up if we went too far astray from the, the original spirit, what we think, right? Also, we have the marketing team, the community team, the user research team, which will help us figure out what the, the spirit is from the player's point of view. Luckily, it is what we think the spirit is. Sometimes it's not. So I think it's important for us to also hear and listen there and then follow that. Early on, when we work on a new project like that, we kind of set between the, the publishing org and the studio, the brand and the game pillars to make sure we kind of always follow them, right? So we don't stray too far away from what that spirit is in the first place and we just make sure every decision we make in scope in how we speak about things just go into that right into that spirit we have a uh, fund no that's fantastic so i mean obviously this becomes much harder the bigger the you mentioned in, you know expectation management but the bigger the sequel is the bigger the audience the more anticipations build up it becomes harder um i spoke to another industry friend michael Dows, publishing director at larian they made a smash hit sequel, Divinity Original Sin 2, and now are making one of the perhaps most anticipated sequels in PC gaming of all time, Baldur's Gate 3. So I had a chat with Michael about sequels, and uh, here's some thoughts from him. So, Michael, when you want to make a sequel, what are the chief concerns from a business standpoint? What, what's on top of mind as you kind of go through that process? One of the things people think about a lot is the... The great disease that ravages the industry, which is, of course, sequelitis, the fear that you'll lose uh, diminishing returns, right? So when you're thinking of a sequel, you're thinking, well, how do we captivate the audience we've grown, but also how do we prevent losing the audience, you know, that haven't played the original games? Um, this is a massive concern. I think we had this um, a lot in the Xbox 360 era. Everyone was shitting out a new IP, just new IPs all over the block. We never saw them again. Um, but now people are doing much more things like Ubisoft is a great example of this. You'll never see like Assassin's Creed 7, 8, 9, 10. They're always uh, of, of the ilk of a sequel, but not quite a sequel, something within the IP, which is the new method. And then you have other massively successful games like The Witcher 3. And they did something that I think is pretty genius, actually, when it comes to handling a sequel uh, pertaining to publishing, which is that the 3 is actually hidden in their logo. You don't see the 3. It's just The Witcher Wild Hunt. So if you know the previous games, you know it's The Witcher 3. If you don't know the previous games, it's just The Wild Hunt. Um, and everything's set up on a story angle where you can just sort of jump in, you know, regardless of where you're from. But still, people, they do lose people, you know. But you catch them in the tail end, you know, after the hype is there. 
so these are really the major concerns, uh, diminishing returns. Um, like talking about DOS 2, I think the first game was, I don't want to say it was all potential. It was a great game, but you could clearly see how you could take that foundationally and make it a lot better um, through iteration. So that's a classic case where a sequel actually made a lot of sense. And it makes a lot of sense to call that two. You know, it, it's like the first one, but a lot better. It's like Assassin's Creed 1 to two, like the first one, but a lot better. But it's after that, when you, when you plateau, that's when you have to think, well, where do we take a sequel from here? Um, there are lots of other ways to do it, like Hitman's a great example too. Um, Hitman Absolution, uh, how do you modernize for the times? That's a whole dev discussion, but then naming it and branding it, uh, using the iconography from the, the first games, but giving it a different name, not saying it's directly a part of that. So it's really about expectation. I think marketing, a lot of people don't realize with marketing that the goal is not to hype primarily. The goal is to create expectations of which hype is often a part. Sometimes it's opposite of hype. Sometimes you want to underhype. Sometimes you know something's not that good, actually. And you kind of want to reel it back a bit. Don't look at uh, me. <laughs> there's nobody else here. Uh, but you know exactly what I mean. Yeah. Um, so it's really setting expectations is really important. With a sequel, it becomes a very scientific thing because you have very certain expectations. There are games that have died for this. So this is this is really interesting what, what Michael says there and something we can absolutely relate to on, on CK3, I think. We've talked a bit about expectations management already. Uh, and as we've mentioned, CK3 is a sequel to one of the most... I, 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 it's going to sound it's going to sound pretentious, but I'll say it's, it's one of the most. It's our podcast. Le- say it. Yeah, it's one of the most legendary strategy games of all time, right? So there's there's obviously a, there's a huge risk of hype running away from us here. So so what Michael is saying is very much true. Marketing for especially for a project like this, an established IP with an existing fan base, is really about expectations management. It's about setting expectations. It's not about just blindly generating hype. But in addition to that. On CK3, we also have an outspoken ambition to reach a wider audience with this game than we usually do with our our, our grand strategy games. So so let's talk a bit, because there's there's an interesting balance there, right? So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, So Max, with CK3 aiming to reach a bigger audience than than CK2 had, how how do you manage communications there? How do you speak differently to existing CK2 players and players for whom uh, CK3 will be the first entry into the franchise or a grand strategy game as such? Yeah, that that is a very good question. And that's definitely something we spent a lot of time thinking about and discussing uh, together with the marketing team, right? Uh, We have a very strong core, hardcore fan audience that's there coming from CK2, from other grand strategy games. And then there is all those new players we want to take with us on the CK3 journey. Uh, And we know that the very first players that will, you know, pay attention to CK3 when we reveal it will be the hardcore fans because they know where to find us, they're looking forward to it. And we know also that's the most important place to capture because without a solid core and solid foundation, there's just not much to, to build upon a community and bring in those new players we want to have. Mm. Uh, so the, the easy decision was like the first half of our campaign was directed towards the, the, the core fans of CK, right? Uh, that's how we decided to choose our topics for the dev diaries. That's how we tune our communication into explaining exactly what the vision and the ambition is versus CK2, which would not make a lot of sense for a new player because they don't have a lot of uh, feeling for what CK2 is. But for the hardcore fans, they know. So it's very important we just speak to them directly and openly about that. Uh, and of course, as we approach uh, the launch, we will ramp up you know, with performance marketing. So those ads you will see for us on the web with the work we do with the community team, press influencers to reach out to those new players, right? Uh, another tool we have used, as you pointed out earlier, is CK2 going uh, free for the base game which and the Monarch's journey, which help us bring players into what CK2 is so that when they catch up with the rest of the discussion, they will know what CK2 and CK in general is and they can uh, enjoy the rest of the campaign on CK3. Yeah, this this is uh, really a conversation about sort of marketing strategy and the the positioning of the product. And and as you say, Max, I think so. Yes, we think CK three has the potential to reach a wider audience than than what a grand strategy game typically does. But we think we can do that by doing what CK two did so well. Perhaps uh, you know you can talk about this at more at great length, uh, Max. But perhaps you know modernizing it a bit, making it a bit easier to get get into. But it's really not about it's not about messing with the core formula, right? It's not about finding a completely new audience for this game. It's about convincing the existing audience to sort of get on board. 
and provided they like the game, hope that they will help us uh, help us by sort of selling it and talking about it to a wider audience. S some media outlets call uh, this is another question from our listeners. Some some media outlets have called CK3 the most approachable paradox game yet. So how do you say we would how do you say we go about balancing the need to sort of retain that trademark? Paradox depth and complexity versus making a game that is more approachable to to, to new players. Yeah, that, that is an interesting question. It's also something that was very important for for us and for the the dev team, the game director, right? And I think the answer here is that we didn't balance anything. That this this idea of trade off that that's not really what we're aiming for. We're not trying to change the game to reach those new players by changing what it is at its core. Because I mean, game depth and complexity is really tantamount to what the, the Paradox and the PDS games are trying to be. So we can't really change that uh, because by trying to appeal to too many people in different ways, then I think you end up risking not appealing to anyone. Mm. For what we wanted to do from the get-go is have a title that's approachable. So we have made plans from the get-go to do that. We didn't change course pathway through to like change everything and make it approachable. And the way we wanted to do that is giving the, the new players uh, all the tools to get to the level they need to be to be proficient at CK3 easier than before. I mean, we know that all games are not always the, the easiest to, to approach. They are quite complex and can be quite daunting. There's a lot of hours of Let's Play and tutorials on YouTube that the community is making that really helps get players on board. We wanted to have some of that as well in our game on uh, with the tool tips, the reactive advice, which I think uh, TJ Hafer accompanied in Rob's article about how it is for him to play over the shoulder of one of his friends and giving him advice. That's what he saw in it, and that's very much what we're trying to do, right? Mm. Um, so for us, it's all about not lowering the floor of complexity. It's more about giving the new players like kind of ladders and pulleys and all of that to to get up there and join the the party on the party floor. Yeah, I think I think also at least hopefully some of this ambition of ours also shines through in the in the sort of branding and the way we've chosen to position the game with with CK three. Uh, you know, anyone who's seen the, the 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 trailers and the assets will will know this. But we're leaning quite heavily into the sort of Machiavellian power fantasy of the game, right? That the tagline "Real strategy requires cunning" and the sort of you know the sort of dynastic medieval soap opera scenarios that unfold so so brilliantly in a CK game. And we this is obviously very true to the brand promise of Crusader Kings, but we also think, or I think anyway, and I'm, I'm sort of guessing that that. I'm hoping that you agree with me, Max, is that this is also something that is very attractive to perhaps a, a, a larger audience than we uh, than we typically see for our games. I think there's something in grand strategy games that is uh, interesting and is attractive to to a lot of people, whilst historically we've not really been, you know, I think I think there's 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 we've done a really good job with CK3 in, in getting to that and encapsulating that and really communicating that essence in a way that we haven't perhaps been able to do in the past. Yeah, no, that's that's very true. I think CK is a, is a good title to bring in new players because we have this strong, you know, character-driven uh, aspect. We have a strong emergent narrative aspect mm. that should appeal to a, a larger audience. And let's say, looking at a map and being a map painter, mm. uh, if you could say like that, yeah. it will uh, really kind of appeal to RPG-style players that want to look, focus on the stories. And I think it's also kind of one of the best way to play CK is focus on what the stories are that are happening rather than trying to min max or trying to quote unquote win at the game because there's no real win there right it's more about the journey and the, the fun stuff that happens along the way and that i think is the kind of players we can hope to reach out i know some articles of the recent press events we had also talked about the themes because there's also a lot of drama that unfolds in this type of game so another big thing, obviously, is that uh, on the topic of reaching new audiences, uh, Crusader Kings 3 will obviously be released on, on, on PC platforms, but it will also be released as part of uh, the Xbox Game Pass for PC. The game isn't coming to Xbox One. There's been some confusion on this, at least not at this point in time. But um, we, the, the game will be releasing as part of Xbox Game Pass for PC. Um, at the same time as it goes live on other storefronts. Max, what effect do you think uh, this will have uh, on the player, by, player base in terms of putting it front and center uh, f for new audiences, as it were? I mean, I think Game Pass is a, is a great opportunity for new players to find about the game, right? Like, we will meet players and players will meet us that we would have never met otherwise. I, I know even for me as a player on Game Pass, I've stumbled upon games I would just have never picked up before because well there's just so many games out there so i think it will be great and it will help us reach a newer audience 
because we have to do our efforts, of course, in the game, right? We have to make it very accessible and very approachable, sorry. Uh, and that's very important. And that will really help us. But then we also have to f- make sure the players find it in the first place. That's what mm. marketing does. And that's uh, Game Pass. There is another tool for us in the toolbox. Uh, yeah. And uh, it is also great for us, I mean, from a business perspective, since we have uh, DLC in a long tail of content, those are also great players for us uh, mm. to engage with that long tail of content while we're on the Game Pass. We actually talked about this a couple of episodes back when we discussed subscription uh, services and what they mean for us. And I think the, the sort of litmus test for services like Game Pass is really for us to, to know how they work with our DLC and expansion model. So, and CK3 will really be the first test of this. Uh, the big question that I'm really looking forward to having answered is, uh, I mean, of course, Game Pass will help us reach a huge new audience of players, but will those players stick around? Will, will these be people that just sample the game for an hour and then move on to something else? Or will we will at least a, a portion of that player base stay with us and really uh, sort of fall in love with CK3 and then stay with that game for a long time, which is really the kind of behavior that we look for and the kind of players that we want for our games. So, so this, this will be too- enormously exciting. Yeah, not too surprisingly, this is exactly why we focus so much on making that the first time user experience yeah. as you know approachable as possible. Like if we're going to have a lot of foot traffic and walk-in traffic to our store, I want to make sure that people kind of stay beyond the first hour. Yeah. So maybe to wrap up with a, with a final question, you can't do anything these days without talking about uh, COVID-19, right? So, so Max, the final question for you, has the development been affected by, by COVID-19, you'd say? Uh, luckily, not, not too much. I mean, the company has taken a decision fairly early on, right, to have us all work from home. Um, and after a week or so of just sending everybody their computer, office chairs, screens, fixing access to the source code repositories from home and so on, Work has pretty much continued unimpeded, I would say. We were kind of pretty well set up from the get-go to work remotely because we already use, you know, a lot of digital tools like Miro for digital whiteboarding, Slack and Hangouts, just as part of our daily daily routines, Jira for bug tracking. So we, we didn't have to set up all of that when we started. Uh, probably the timing was right, if we can say that, uh, because we are entering our uh, a phase where we're just like all focusing on putting the last touch to the game. Mm. Uh, so it's probably the least inopportune time, I would say, to to have this kind of big change coming up there. Uh, in general, I would say the, the, the company leadership and the, the producers who have the project, Linda and Camille, have been just great at communicating, trying to set up all of that and making it feel as normal as possible. We have digital FICA, digital coffee breaks uh, in the afternoons for the team and uh, trying to make sure everybody is keeping their mental health and uh, keeping sane, right? Hmm. That's fantastic. Okay, I think that's it. Max, thank you so much for coming to the show. CK3 is releasing September 1st. I'm already playing it, so are many in the office. I'm playing a multiplayer session with Fred Wester and Johan Anderson. We're scheming, killing, and screwing our way through the Iberian Peninsula. It's a lot of fun, and it's, you know, it's CK. So, thanks for listening. Please let us know what you think. Leave a comment where you listen. Hit like, subscribe. It's one of our KPIs. We need those. Uh, And as always, you can reach us on Twitter and ask us stuff and tell us we should make Victoria free because we know that you will all ask for that sequel sooner or later. Take care, stay safe, wash your hands and play some games. Bye. Bye. Bye.